Where was Mr. Big Voice until the very end there? Now, there's a question I have for you. Apparently, he's got a little bit of laryngitis and had to come in a little late. Seven minutes after 8 o'clock, Bill Colley with you this Friday morning. It is Friday. Everybody, of course, loves Friday unless you have one of those jobs where you work weekends. I have some friends who are in nursing, and they work every other weekend. And uh, all of my friends in nursing are working this weekend, so this is their Wednesday, right? That, that's how you look at it. I want to thank you for joining us today. Some of the things that we have going on, obviously, we'll be talking about Benghazi this morning. And in the next hour, we have a candidate coming in. He is a challenger for Twin Falls City Council named Neil Christensen. He'll share with us why he's running and what he thinks he can do for the city. So that's on the way as well. And if we get a chance, I've got a story. It's another one of those stories. We shared one with you a couple of weeks ago about about the school in Wyoming. Actually, it wasn't too far from here. It's over near Jackson Hole, where a lot of liberals live. And they didn't want the students having an America, an American Patriot theme day at school. Well, at one school in another part of the West, something similar is now going on. We'll share that if we get a chance a little later in the program. But first, some of the Benghazi reaction coming in is certainly predictable. If mainstream media has any indication, and I told you yesterday morning, mainstream media, no matter what Hillary Clinton said or did, would say Hillary Clinton came out looking you know, really, really well, and Republicans look bad. And remember, vote for Hillary on Election Day, although we here at mainstream media claim to be objective. This comes from a fellow writing on the rightward side. His name is Eric Erickson. You hear him sometimes subbing for Rush Limbaugh. And he's writing today, Eric on the radio is his website, he's writing today about the hearings, and he said, well, there really wasn't any need for them. He, he went on to say this, it was all political spectacle. spectacle. Yes, yeah, spectacle. Yeah, there you go. New word coming out of my mouth. Isn't that, isn't that a James Bond villain? No, that's Spectre. Okay. It was all political spectacle. There you go. God bless Trey Gowdy, he says, for trying to learn the facts and understand what happened, but the rest of it was just a carnival roadshow or backbench Congress critters playing to the cameras and Hillary Clinton working hard to play persecuted victim. Yeah, I mean, in, in other words, they got a few things on the record. That's what they were looking to do. And otherwise, if you were expecting a three-hour you know, roller coaster ride, you didn't get it if you were sitting there watching it. In fact, probably for the first two hours and 45 minutes, you were snoozing. And then all of a sudden, you heard some yelling, and you opened your eyes, and you had the chance to see all of this. One of the most interesting takes on what happened, and I think there's some truth to this, most Americans aren't really listening to the detail of what's going on. At least this is the, the thought that comes out of the mouth of a very well-known pundit from Washington, I want to get to him in a minute, but just take a listen to some of the sounds from this hearing. Now, this is about a minute long. This will give you a little bit of the flavor that's going on. This was compiled by Fox News. After all these months, she's finally here. So I'm here. There are people, frankly, in both parties who have suggested that this investigation is about you. Let me assure you it is not. They established the select committee to drive down Secretary Clinton's poll numbers. This investigation is about four people who were killed. Why has no one been held accountable? I was the one who asked Chris to go to Libya. You had two ambassadors that made several, several requests, and here's basically what happened to their requests. No one ever came to me and said, we should shut down our compound in well, Benghazi. I'm not saying shut it down. I'm saying protected. I stood next to President Obama as Marines carried his casket and those of the other three Americans. The questions are increasingly badgering. We haven't really covered any new ground. The answers have changed not at all. We have learned nothing. Conclusions drawn. Um, I don't draw conclusions until the end. Now, you heard Elijah Cummings in there. If you don't know who Elijah Cummings is, he's the ranking Democrat on that committee. He's an illiterate. I mean, he's a representative from the state of Maryland. Uh, who got elected in a district that pretty much just wanted to send along somebody who would bring home the bacon. And Elijah Cummings, there, you've already, if you've been paying attention to all of the news coverage of this, you've seen Elijah Cummings screaming and yelling uh, near the end of the hearing yesterday trying to put on a little political theater. So I'm not going to share that with you again. And when he speaks, it just sounds as if he's instructing you in like it's in a bonics class. And I thought, well, if he can't even speak English, let's skip that this morning on this program. So there's the montage, a little bit about what happened there yesterday. Meanwhile, Charles Krauthammer, speaking on Fox News last night, being uh, in a conversation with Brett Baer, he is, he is talking about the situation and says, that's what people are looking at. They're looking at the screaming and they're making their judgments on all of this based on that, and, and not about the, the actual words that are coming out of this. They don't care about Blumenthal. She had a way when she lowered her voice and talked about the sleepless nights. Uh, it was a gripping 
performance, which is the way I would put it, so I can remain neutral on this. But uh, showing that she really cared, etc., or at least giving that impression. And that's what's going to be shown. And the, uh, the only thing that's going to be shown on the committee other than that in the clips is going to be the Trey Gowdy interchange with Cummings, which of course is a conflict, reality TV, and a nice little bit of heat. We're not going to get the, the contradictions, we're not going to get the facts, and we're not going to get the real story underlying it. We're living in an age where what you say and its relation with the facts is completely irrelevant, as we see in the presidential campaign, and it's carrying over into the hearings. Style over substance is what that used to be called. Style over substance. You say a lot of things, you make a lot of noise, it gets a lot of attention, and it obscures all of the facts that have been presented. For instance, most people today are saying, oh boy, she really showed them, or Cummings really showed them. That's what you're getting from the left. And if you're on the right, you're saying, well, Gaudi and Jordan were good, I guess, and that's, that's about it. And in all of this, you, you, you realize she said she never heard from Ambassador Stevens, even though he was in what was a war zone and a war she helped create. She never heard his requests for additional security. I don't know if you picked this up. I think the number was that he sent 600 emails, he and the staff, making the requests. And she, as Secretary of State, who was presiding over this mission in Benghazi, this, it's not the ambassador's residence, it was the consulate, it's not the actual embassy, she said she never heard from any of them while they were stationed in the middle of this war zone. That was one thing that I thought was surprising. In fact, she said, well, you know, he didn't make an effort to reach me. So she put the blame on, on Ambassador Stevens, who, by the way, can't defend himself because he was killed there. You understand how this is, is all coming together now. She, well, gosh, I had no idea that they had any problems. I thought they were swimming in the pool and, and having barbecues every night. And, uh, and and having all of the dancing girls over from the local Libyan community. And gosh, my husband would be doing that. I don't understand why they wouldn't. Over at the Wall Street Journal, they're picking this apart. The editor at the Wall Street Journal writing this editorial today says, don't believe those who say we learn nothing. The hearing turned up new information that relates directly to the former Secretary of State's political character and judgment as a potential commander-in-chief. Remember that story about that, that, that hokey film, uh, you know, <laughs> about, about uh, Muhammad, and that was what they said had caused all of this. I even remember at the, at the debates, Mitt Romney tried to talk a little bit about al-Qaeda being involved, and he was shut down by Chris Matthews, who was moderating one of the debates. Of course, Matthews is just a wholly owned subsidiary of the Democrat Party, and Matthews says, no, it's about the film. Everybody knows it's about the film. I wonder if he's going to actually come around and do a mea, mea culpa on that. Ah, he thought you might have forgotten that one. The select committee led by Gowdy, that's Trey Gowdy of South Carolina, released hitherto undisclosed documents showing that Mrs. Clinton believed from the start that the attack was perpetrated by terrorists. At 11.12 p.m. on the night of the attack, that was September 11th, three years ago, Mrs. Clinton emailed her daughter Chelsea that, quote, two of our officers were killed in Benghazi by an Al-Qaeda-like group, unquote. The committee also released a State Department summary of Mrs. Clinton's call the next day, with Egypt's prime minister. Quote, we know that the attack in Libya had nothing to do with the film. It was a planned attack, not a protest. Unquote, Mrs. Clinton said. The call summary then blocks out a comment by the Egyptian, to which Mrs. Clinton replies, quote, you're not kidding. Based on the information we saw today, we believe the group that claimed responsibility for this was affiliated with al-Qaeda. Unquote. All right. So, she, she, she told her daughter it was a terrorist attack the night before, as it was going on. Her daughter in the email, can we note this, was not a, her daughter's email was not actually a Chelsea Clinton. It was, she was using a phony name, which ought to shed a little bit more light, too, on how the Clintons exchange email information. So she said it was a terrorist attack. The following day, she's in a conversation with the Egyptian prime minister, who, who is next door in the country next door to Libya, and she says it's a terrorist attack. Twice! Twice! If Mrs. Clinton, the writer says, was telling people privately that it was a terror attack, why hint publicly at some other motivation? The following Sunday, Susan Rice, then U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, so she worked for Mrs. Clinton, went on national television and blamed the attacks on the video. Mrs. Clinton knew that was false. Mrs. Clinton also told the father of one of the victims that the U.S. would have the creator of the anti-Muslim video prosecuted. 
To my knowledge, that guy is still sitting in a prison somewhere in California. <laughs> you want to talk about a political prisoner? Uh, and it, Oh, we, we don't have that in the good old USA now, do we? Jim Jordan, if you've heard that name before, he is a congressman from Ohio. The reason you may have heard it over the last few days is because Raul Labrador, who has been on the air with us just this week, Raul Labrador is considered his right-hand man at the U.S. House of Representatives. These are guys who are digging down to get to the truth. And Jordan was, uh, was asked last night, almost accused last night on the Kelly file on Fox News Channel, if indeed he was trying to politicize this, making it a partisan dispute. Jordan shot back with this. What did you see partisan from the questions we asked? We're trying to get to the truth. Look, I disagree with what, what some of my colleagues have said. I think that was wrong. I don't think that's the focus. It never has been the focus. The chairman's been clear. We've been clear. And you could see this hearing today for yourself. What was partisan about that? What's partisan about she telling the Egyptian prime minister one thing and telling the American people something else? That's not partisan. That's her statements. She started the whole video narrative at 10.08, the night of the attacks, an hour and a half before the attacks were over. She tells the American people it was a video inspired. That she, she references that. She starts that narrative at 10.08 with Tyrone Woods and Glenn Doherty still on the roof of that annex fighting for their lives. That's the message we did. That's not partisan. That's about the facts. I think that that's pretty clear at this point. So you'll still have people digging in their heels over on the leftist side saying, no, 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 no. They'll be putting their fingers in their ears so they don't hear that. They'll be shutting it all out because Hillary's promised to bring them lots of toys if she's elected. 818, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. People died. Hillary and Obama lied and people died because after they said it was caused by the film, people in the Islamic world who'd never heard of the film or watched the film then went out and rioted because of the film. There were riots all across the Islamic world. People died. Many of them were Christians. Some of them were Christians who were bolted in their churches and their churches torched. Nuns were shot dead. This is, this is not how you go about conducting yourself if you're a decent human being. If you, if you go around and for your own personal gain are willing to sacrifice the lives of others and you, you, you shed lies or you tell lies in order to, to do that, then there is something seriously wrong with your character. You might as well just say they're criminal. And, in fact, they have blood on their hands. And those murders that happened all over the Islamic world, well, then they colluded in causing the, um, creating the situation that would cause those, those murders. Bill Colley with you on Top Story this morning on News Radio 1310 KLIX. That ought to get old Jose fired up today. 45, we've got more coming up. Your reaction to some of this, too, I suspect, as well. I'll share with you some of the comments after the hearing from Trey Gowdy, who was chairing the event. More coming up. In fact, coming up in the next hour, we have a candidate running for Twin Falls City Council, Neil Christensen, joining us in studio. Hey, it's funny. I was just talking about Glenn Miller this morning with one of my coworkers. Yeah, we sit around the office at 5.30 a.m. and discuss old big band leaders. Actually, it was related to another Another, another topic and used as an analogy. 823, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Thanks for joining us this morning. It's 44. If you're listening to this program this morning, it's because your hearing is still in pretty good shape. And if you have issues with hearing, we'd like to remind you you can get a screening if you contact Dr. Christine Pickup. She is a doctor of audiology. With Mott Harrison Audiology, and that should be a giveaway as to lo the location. She's in Rupert. In fact, at 1218 9th Street, unit number 2. Telephone number at the office is 208-312-0957. That's 208-312-0957. Or you can go to the website, mottharrisonaudiology.com. Remember, diabetes and hearing loss are linked. If you or a loved one struggles with diabetes control, it could also be affecting your hearing. The inner ear is incredibly sensitive to changes in your blood supply. High blood sugars can cause hearing changes. Be sure to have your hearing screened today. So I was, I was mentioning off the top of the show a uh, little discussion about the Benghazi hearings. I don't know if any of you even bothered to watch them. I know it's not necessarily the most entertaining television you could ever come across. Uh, especially there were no fireworks, as they say. Media kept saying fireworks, fireworks, fireworks at the end. So for the first two hours and 45 minutes, nothing really happened, according to media. 
and then there was some screaming. And all you've seen likely is the screaming. But I think you understand. We we have an occasional caller, the only liberal, I think, that really calls the program anymore. An occasional caller who will say, yeah, but George Bush, or yeah, but but Ronald Reagan, or yeah, but, but uh, Dwight Eisenhower, or William Howard Taft, and he'll keep doing that as if that excuses everything liberals have done. Look, if liberals claim that they are the party of the little guy and they are the party of compassion, that would imply that they also believe that they're the party of honesty. How is it compassionate to weave a story and lock up a filmmaker, weave the story that he is responsible for this terrorist attack before no one in the world had ever heard of this guy or his, his, his whacked out film, and then cause riots all over the world to guarantee your re-election? So you don't have to admit that it was an Al-Qaeda attack because you said you'd whipped Al-Qaeda, and that was a cornerstone of your campaign. How can you, as a leftist, go on and then defend that, unless it really comes down to the fact you don't really care about people or compassion? It's all about control. And as long as your guy is in control, you're okay with that, which then really gets down to the bottom of your character. And this is why I think that liberals... And leftists and socialists don't have any. They never had a fully formed conscience. They have an abnormal conscience, a corrupted conscience. Say 26. Bill Colley with you on Top Story. And you're welcome, all of you lefties out there listening. I, I just, you know, I think that that's probably something that you're aware of, but you're still in a state of denial. 826. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. Now, I mentioned the fact 600 emails were sent from Benghazi, from the ambassador to the State Department saying, we need more help here. We have no security to really speak of. Peggy Noonan, writing at the Wall Street Journal today, says there were hundreds of requests regarding security, and Mrs. Clinton said none reached her desk. Noonan says, this is remarkable, a secretary of state who supported a military action that unleashed chaos and sends her friend, the ambassador, into the chaos, has no awareness of his request for more security. Sidney Blumenthal had her personal email address, but Ambassador Chris Stevens didn't. Blumenthal is the guy she wanted to hire at the State Department, and he was so despised at the White House, they said no. So instead, Blumenthal went to work for her husband over at the Clinton Foundation. Blumenthal had business interests in Libya, and he was asking the Secretary of State, her name at the time, Hillary Clinton, to assist him with his business interests. So she was reading his emails, but she was not reading the emails of Ambassador Stevens. How does that one work? I don't know if you heard the exchange yesterday, but Gaudi brought up the subject of Blumenthal, and when he said, you know, where did where where did he end up working? Uh, Mrs. Clinton was like, yeah, hem and a hem and a hem and a hem and a hem and a. And then Gaudi said something to the effect of, he went to work for your husband. Yes, he went to work for my husband. And then Gotti has to draw it out of her at the Clinton Foundation. Uh, hem and a hem and a hem. Uh, 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 mm, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sydney, who? 828. Bill Colley with you on Top Story. How, how much longer can this go on? And I know you're going to have the mainstream media has a much bigger megaphone than people like me, even bigger than all of talk radio. But how much longer can this continue before someone finally just says, Enough. Say 28. Trey Gowdy was speaking following the, the hearing, and he was questioned by reporters on what happened there. And just want to share a little bit of that with you. I did tell you in my opening count how many times you hear my colleagues to the left ask the executive branch to produce documents. Um, I counted zero. She's one important witness out of what's now more than 50 important witnesses, and there are a couple dozen left to go. So. Uh, in terms of conclusions drawn, um, I don't draw conclusions until the end. I thought it was a constructive interaction, and I was trying to be a little slow with the, with the gavel so she wouldn't get cut off. I tr- we tried hard not to cut her off. Now what she's going to do from here on out, if this question never comes up again about Benghazi, she's going to be saying, well, I went to the hearing, all these questions have been answered. Don't bother me with that. I, well, I'm here to talk to you today instead about growing petunias in your backyard and how it can reverse global warming. We're not here to talk about Benghazi. I mean, after all, what difference does it make? That's the escape clause she's got now out of this. However, there's still an FBI investigation going on. 
Gowdy said yesterday this was not a prosecution, it's an investigation, and she is one of about 70 witnesses so far called by this committee. So they're just gathering details about what happened. Meanwhile, the FBI is looking into her email situation, and she may yet end up in a striped costume chopping rocks at Leavenworth. Yeah, they'll stick her in the kitchen, I guess. She finally learned to bake cookies. 45. Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Got a lot more coming up this morning. Oh, Paul Ryan looks like a shoe in now for the House of Representatives. They got a nice distraction yesterday, so that deal's done.